Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Monday, the 23rd of February. You're tuned in to our mid-morning newscast here on Arirang TV. It's great that you could join us. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Most of Korea's central region is under the effect of a hazardous yellow dust storm. In Seoul, we are currently seeing levels of around 1,000 micrograms of dust per cubic meter of air. As reports emerge suggesting Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will soon address U.S. Congress, Seoul condemns Tokyo for an annual event promoting Japan's claims to Korea's Dokdo Island. Plus, a river ferry capsizes in Bangladesh after being hit by a cargo vessel, killing at least 48 people. Well, we start with the dangerously high level of air pollution that has blanketed skies above much of Korea. Uh, as you can see behind me, it is extremely dusty in Seoul and the usual skyline has receded into a dense uh, greyish smog. For more, let's connect to our weathercaster, Ijeon. Uh, the weather center who has the latest figures and it really doesn't make pretty reading does it Gian? Well you're right on that Mark. The capital Seoul is covered in a toxic haze of yellow dust. Uh, these are particles that blow across from China and Mongolia and they contain lots of unpleasant stuff including chemicals so you don't want to be exposing yourself to it. Uh, this yellow dust storm started blowing in late uh, yesterday afternoon and has continued to get worse overnight particularly in Seoul and this is the first yellow dust warning of the year. Uh, this warning, the highest level has been issued for Seoul and advisories are in place for other parts of the peninsula. Now, the, the level of dust right now is way beyond even the hazardous level. It is essentially off the charts, hitting well over 900 micrograms per cubic meter of air here in Seoul and it's expected to remain quite high throughout the day today. Yeah, really high throughout the day. And uh, most of the people I've been speaking to say they've never seen it this bad before. Uh, you can taste it in your mouth and it gets into your nose if you're outside too long. Uh, we hear that lots of schools have cancelled outdoor activities today, as you would expect. But uh, uh, what should we be doing to protect ourselves and our families against the yellow dust? Well, fortunately, we can avoid getting exposed by uh, being outdoors, uh, not only for the elderly young child, but for all the general public. Even when you're inside, close on the windows and drink plenty of water is very important because by doing so, it will keep your tears flowing well and prevent skin dehydration. And avoid wearing a contact lenses and wear glasses instead and wash your hands and face, eyes with warm water frequently and this will help you to stay safe. So please bear these tips in mind and stay safe, everyone. Well, thank you very much, Gion. And uh, most forecasters are saying that the air quality should hopefully be returning to normal by uh, Tuesday morning Korea time, we hope. Now, moving on to the rest of the day's news. And Korea has slammed Japan for a ceremony celebrating its erroneous territorial claim to Korea's Dokdo Island, saying the move is historically regressive. In a statement Sunday, a foreign ministry spokesman said the Japanese government's action makes Seoul question the sincerity of Tokyo's pledge to improve their bilateral relationship this year, which marks the 50th anniversary of the establishment or the normalization of their diplomatic relationship. Japan's Shimane Prefecture promotes its claim to Dokdo every year on February 22nd. The Japanese government sent a vice minister level official to the ceremony. The third straight year it has sent a senior official to the event. The official falsely claimed Dokdo was an inherent part of Japan's territory under international law. And Korea's foreign ministry says it's going to summon a senior diplomat from the Japanese embassy in Seoul to protest this event, and they're going to do that this morning. Now, speculation is growing that Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will address U.S. Congress when he travels to Washington later this spring. Sources in Tokyo say congressional leaders are leaning towards approving the move, but it could face some resistance from Korean Americans who say Abe should apologize 
uh, for Japan's wartime atrocities before he is allowed to give such a high-profile speech in the U.S. Our Sun jung in reports. A source familiar with the issue says Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will likely give a speech before U.S. Congress during his planned visit to Washington in late April or early May. The source said Abe strongly expressed his will to a congressional delegation from the U.S. who recently visited Tokyo. Many U.S. congressional leaders, including House Speaker John Boehner, are known to be leaning toward letting Abe speak to Congress. If Abe gets the green light, it will mark the first time a Japanese prime minister has addressed U.S. Congress in 54 years. Former Prime Minister Hayato Ikeda was the last Japanese leader to give a speech before the House of Representatives all the way back in 1961. Before that, Nobusuke Kishi addressed Congress in 1957 and Shigeru Yoshida in 1954. Abe reportedly wants to speak before a joint session of the lower and upper house, something no Japanese prime minister has ever done before. However, some obstacles stand in his way. Many Korean Americans are opposed to Abe's move as he's expected to promote Japan as a country that has followed a peaceful path since the end of World War II. A task force for a Korean council in Washington for women drafted for military sexual slavery by Japan said they launched a petition campaign on Sunday. They will submit a formal letter to California Congressman Ed Royce, saying they're opposed to the idea unless Abe makes a sincere apology over Japan's historical wrongdoings first. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye has a busy schedule next month as she is planning a nine-day trip to four countries in the Middle East starting March 1st. This will be the president's first overseas trip of the year. Her first destination will be Kuwait, followed by Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE and Qatar. The presidential office of Chong Wa Dae says President Park will hold summits with the leaders of each nation. The talks are expected to touch on the fields of energy, construction and medicine as well as security issues on the Korean Peninsula and in the Middle East. Now, in another sign of North Korea uh, seeking to bolster its ties with Moscow, reports are saying that the North's trade minister is embarking on a week-long trip to Russia, citing sources in the Russian capital. Seoul-based Yonap News Agency says Lee Yong-nam is expected to arrive in Vladivostok on Monday, then he's going to travel to Moscow later in the week. It's speculated Lee will discuss the prospects of bilateral economic cooperation with Russian officials. The North Korean minister could also talk about North Korean leader Kim Jong-un possibly attending Russia's World War II commemorative ceremony that's going to be held in May. The U.S. government says its missile defense capability does not serve the purpose of keeping China in check. The State Department, citing Assistant Secretary for Arms Control Frank Rose, said the U.S. missile defense system aims to defend American territory from attacks involving intercontinental ballistic missiles, but doesn't affect either China or Russia's deterrence. Uh, Rose added, Washington's ground course missile defense system which is a key part of its defense, is for countering North Korea and Iran's ICBMs. The comments come after Beijing expressed strong opposition to Washington's interest in deploying its hit-to-kill anti-ballistic missile system, or as it's otherwise known, FAD system, to the Korean peninsula. China fears such a move would compromise its strategic security. Now, people in Korea are getting back to their day-to-day -day lives after the Lunar New Year's holiday, which lasted uh, five days this year. But thousands of kilometers away in West Africa, there are still very brave volunteers fighting the Ebola virus over there. And while Korea's third and final support team begins a new operation on this Monday, back here in Korea, medical staff from the first team have been speaking about their experiences in Sierra Leone. Now, Gwonsua reports. It was a time of fear, sadness, exhaustion and hope for the Korean medical team that was dispatched to Sierra Leone, one of the three West African countries most affected by the, in many cases, deadly Ebola virus. 
Members of the first Korean team who are returning to their daily lives after a three-week quarantine that ended a week ago recently spoke to reporters about their month-long mission. They said it was a very meaningful experience to have done what they, as ordinary Korean citizens, did. But it didn't come without hardship. They began their day with a routine of putting on their personal protective equipment, which was one of their most crucial tasks. With the mask, the hood and the face shield, your whole face feels tight, and hearing your own breath from that close doubles the tension. But the hardest part by far was letting their patients go. The first patient I saw die was a little child. That was a shock to me. But as the team leader said, it was all worth it, as the country needs to upgrade its capacity to deal with epidemics like Ebola. With Korea's high medical standards for dispatching support teams for treatment and research, I believe we will help in contributing to the global public's health. The third and final team is scheduled to begin a one-month mission near Sierra Leone's capital of Freetown on Monday. The number of Ebola cases has been on the decline in recent months, but it's not over yet. The most recent death toll stands at around 9,400 people. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now, international news time, and a ferry has capsized in Bangladesh, killing dozens of people, and an unknown number are still unaccounted for. For more on this and uh, some other global headlines, we're following this Monday morning from Seoul. We connect to Eunice Kim at uh, the news centre. So, Eunice, what's the latest on this Bangladesh ferry? Well, Mark, the sun has just risen on a new day in Bangladesh, a day marked with grief for many families. Mourning the passage of four dozen people recovered from the waters of Padma River. As of Sunday evening, emergency crew had discovered 48 bodies, and authorities say it appears the double-decker river ferry was hit by a cargo vessel some 40 kilometers northwest of the capital of Dhaka before capsizing. It is not clear how many people were are on board as ferries in Bangladesh do not typically keep formal passenger lists. One official put the estimate at 140 people. An investigation has been launched into the cause of the capsize with the captain and the two crew members in police custody. Bangladesh is no stranger to ferry accidents. A similar accident killed at least seven people on February 13th. Yes, uh, Bangladesh, of course, has a number of issues, serious issues with safety, uh, especially on public transportation services such as that ferry. Now let's move over to uh, Turkey now. And Turkish forces actually moved over the weekend. They went into Syria to preemptively remove the remains of a historic tomb amid threats by uh, Islamic State extremists to strike it. Yeah, that's right. It's a historic tomb because it holds the remains of Suleiman Shah, who died in the 13th century and was the grandfather of the founder of the Ottoman Empire. Now, this tomb was located in an enclave in northern Syria that Turkey considers to be its sovereign territory. But amid uh, that IS threat, which came last year, Ankara launched a nine hour operation late Saturday day to evacuate the precious remains as well as the 38 honor guards that who had guarded it to an area closer to the border. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's government uh, has lost control over much of that region amid the ongoing civil war, but it lambasted the operation as a flagrant aggression. Now this as the Islamic State group released a new propaganda video, this time showing 21 caged men in orange jumpsuits who it says were Kurdish Peshmerga forces. A man in the video in Kurdish called on fighters to give up their struggle or face a fate in a cage or quote under the ground. And Eunice there was a pretty significant disclosure from a US official over the weekend that the US was considering uh, training forces to take part in an offensive to retake the Iraqi city of Mosul uh, which has been 
in the hands of the IS group for months now. Right, the de facto capital of the group. You can say this disclosure came from a senior military official that the Obama administration and the Pentagon are in the process of determining now how difficult it would be to overtake that key city of Mosul with the aim of launching the operation in April or May before the hot summers hits in Iraq. Now, the incoming U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter arrived in Kuwait from Afghanistan just hours ago ahead of his swearing-in ceremony slated for Tuesday. He faces the question of whether to recommend U.S. ground troops in that potential assault. Currently, American forces are limited to training Iraqi and Kurdish troops, and the Pentagon is set to start training Syrian fighters next month outside of the country, Mark. Well, Eunice, thank you very much for your comprehensive reports this morning, and we'll see you back at noon. See you then. Chinese tourists are visiting Korea in ever larger numbers and they generally spend a lot of money during their stay, compared to other nationalities at least. So the government is stepping up efforts to accommodate them by uh, building some resort complexes equipped with casinos. For this week's Industry Insight, our Kim ji takes a look at the challenges and rewards for Korea's casino industry. Will the opening of resort complexes, equipped with hotels, shops and casinos, bring investment and boost the economy? The Korean government is betting it will. It believes it can raise 1.8 billion U.S. dollars from the casino industry. Now it's letting Korean companies get in on the bidding, a privilege once reserved for foreign investors. Just last month, the Ministry of Strategy and Finance gave the green light to the development of two additional foreigner-only casino and resort complexes in the country's free economic zones. It plans to select the two licensees by 2020. Already, the country has attracted investors for two complexes on Yeongjongdo Island located in the western city of Incheon. The Korea-based Paradise Group and the multinational casino firm Caesars Entertainment Corporation are each building a resort complex there. Both are seeking to be the Korean version of Singapore's Marina Bay Sands, which raised $5.4 billion in sales last year. But challenges lie ahead if they're to survive in the competition against the massive casino and resort complexes in Macau and Okinawa. But mainly, there's the China risk factor. The income of casinos in Korea is heavily reliant on visiting Chinese tourists. That's because the Korean government currently bans its nationals from all casinos except one. The casino in northeastern Gangwon-do province is the only one Korean nationals can go to. The other 16 casinos rely on those with foreign passports. The tourism ministry says the combined sales of foreigner-only casinos is at around $1.2 billion, similar to the sales at the casino in Gangwon-do. The restriction placed on Korean nationals will affect the competitiveness of the Korean casino industry. The scale and amount of investment in the resort complexes is going to be smaller than in other neighboring countries. Korea is capping investments in its complexes at $900 million a year, a figure far below that of its rivals. Meanwhile, Chinese President Xi Jinping is increasingly trying to root out gambling as part of an anti-corruption campaign. That has raised fears the Chinese government will restrict its nationals from gambling, both home and abroad. Kim Jong, Arirang News. Now, staying with some economic news, and it's rather discouraging news, unfortunately, for those looking to get a job this year, as it appears Korean firms aren't likely to recruit many new employees. The Bank of Korea's Employment Business Survey Index stood at 94 at the beginning of the year. That's the highest it's been in nearly five years. The index measures whether companies feel they have enough employees or not. The higher the number, the more satisfied the firms feel with the current number of their workers. Korea's employment BSI had been falling since late 2009, but started to pick up last year. More than a third of Korea's largest firms by sales say they will hire a combined 22,000 new employees this year, down 2.3% from a year earlier. Now, every field has a pioneer or a legendary 
figure for Korean folk music. That person is the late Ji Young Hee. Now, Ji steadfastly guarded, updated, and promoted Korean folk music during Japan's colonial rule of Korea, and even made inroads into Europe and America. Now, Kim Min Ji has a story. <laughs> What you're listening to is the Hegem Sanjo, a genre of folk music evolving the traditional Korean string instrument, Hegem. A master of the genre was Ji Young Hee, who was referred to in Korea as the father of Korean folk music. It may not be a familiar name, but Ji, who is honored in his country as an intangible cultural asset, is considered a legendary figure who made great contributions to Korean music. Born in 1909, Ji spent most of his life preserving and developing folk music. Ji Young Yi created jobs for musicians who were mistreated at the time and helped foster an environment for them to be respected. And if it hadn't been for his efforts to transcribe the music, Korean folk would never have existed. Ji also took his passion to the international level. Through performances in Europe and America, including at Carnegie Hall in 1964, he was able to demonstrate the excellence of traditional Korean music. Ji Young Yi had a dream in disseminating our traditional folk music to the people in America and across the world. When he first went to France and he did a traditional performance, the people there, the coordinators, uh, they were just overwhelmed with the music and they actually complimented them, saying that your music uh, exceeds our Western music and it is even greater than ours. He also modified the instruments to create a larger range of tones, just like the ones that are still used today. His keepsakes, from his bicycle and passport to his manuscripts, are still preserved, and his works are still performed and loved to this day by Koreans and non-Koreans alike. I'm enjoying the performance very much. It's, um, it's beautiful music. It is, it is very different from Western music, but it's, it's interesting to hear. Today, the members of his family, some of the musicians themselves, are living proof of G's achievements, and they have since taken up the mantle of promoting the uniqueness of traditional Korean folk music. Kim min Arirang News. And a good Monday morning to you all as we kick things off in the LPGA where the Koreans were looking for their third straight victory to start off the new season going into the final round of the ISPS Honda Women's Australian Open on Sunday. But well, let's just say it's not three straight but 2.5 if that makes any sense as teenage sensation and Korean New Zealander Lydia Ko holds on to her lead shooting a nine under par overall including an eagle in the final hole to clinch her first victory of the season. And with the latest win, it's already her sixth title of her career as Amy Yang comes oh so close for the Koreans in their bid for their third straight as she finishes two strokes behind Lydia Ko in second place. Now, if Lydia Ko was making all the noise in Australia, Pittsburgh Pirates Kang Jong Ho was doing just the same over in Florida, where his team's currently preparing for their new season. And after batting practice over the weekend, expectations, well, higher than ever. Now, a lot of thumbs up and nice swing Jung Ho comments during his latest batting practice, where the former Nexon hero sent most of his swings deep, including two that went over the wall. Now, what was impressive about the swings was that the wind was blowing in, preventing many of the balls to go deep, yet he was on par with some of the big swingers on the team like Andrew McCutcheon. Now, Kang also showed that he can spread the ball around, hitting to all parts of the field during practice. Now, while Kang Jong-ho is enjoying a nice spring training with the Pittsburgh Pirates, former Kia Tigers ace Yoon Sung min is training on his own at the Boris Corporation, as all signs point to his major league career coming to an end even before it started. Now, with Orioles manager Buck Showalter leaving him off the spring training roster, he was instead included in the minor league camp. But the righty decided to refuse the invitation and has been training on his own, hoping for a last-minute invite to the Orioles spring camp. Now, if Yoon Sung Min isn't invited, chances are he'll never step onto the Major League mound and possibly return to Korea. Now, ever since the 2012 London Summer Games, Korea has been on fire when it comes to fencing competitions. And with the fourth stage of the FIE Fencing World Cup taking place over the weekend in Poland, Kubong Gir 
continued its dominance, beating Romania's Tiberiu Doniceu 15 to 8 to claim the gold medal. Now, with the gold medal finish, he also takes 32 points in the latest world rankings and is the top-ranked fencer in the men's single saber with 240 points. And with that said, that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Well, that is all we have for now. Plenty more stories online. If you are in Korea, please remember to take the necessary precautions against the high levels of yellow dust we're seeing across the country. Stay indoors if you can. If you have to go outside, uh, try and wear a mask at least. We'll be back at noon with a further update on the yellow dust with our next newscast as well. So until then, goodbye.